Ms. Atke Dryadajanki LSC. She will present the speech about oppression and liberation, the role of religion and culture. But before that, I would like to read the curriculum vitae of Ms. Ake. Please help me, committee, to... Okay. Ms. Ake Dryadajong, uh, uh, now is director and owner PT Sasak Studio Sejati and co-founder and treasurer from Yayasan Kebon Sepatu Indonesia. Her education, uh, the last is from Accreditation Psychoanalysis Center of Excellence in 2020. Work experience, there are many work experience here. Uh, now and from February 2020 until present, she is a director and owner of PT Sasak Studio Se Sejati. And for course and certificates, she uh, soul beliefs, causes and consequences with distinction. Yeah, and she also uh, have the certificates of understanding the brain, the neurobiology of everyday life with distinction. And after that, uh, clinical psychology of children and adolescents, and also presumes innocence, social science of wrongful conviction uh, with distinctions. And there are many course and certificates she uh, has. But for uh, this afternoon, uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Ake to present her speech. Please, Ms. Ake, the screen is yours. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Ika. I'm very sorry I have to start apologizing immediately because I got a mix up in the names. So I spoke before my turn. And um, also, I would like to thank the board of directors of uh, Benelli for their kind invitation to share my thoughts on today's topic. Religion and cultural aspects in oppression and liberation. My observations and remarks are broadly based on personal views from a Western perspective. And I'm aware that these differ quite dramatically from our other cultures and convictions. From the latest data, we find that the Netherlands only has 23% registered Roman Catholics and 50% of the population do not even follow a religion. However, before I start my contribution to this most interesting topic, we need to focus on the very essence on how religion originated. In other words, also from an anthropological phenomena, what was the main driving force? One can determine that from the very beginning, mankind was ardently in pursuit of knowledge. And when we go from a macro perspective to a micro perspective, this means searching for the ongoing quest of the origin of time around one question, why? This main idea that our hunger for knowledge is the origin of Adam and Eve's expulsion from paradise can be found in the book Genesis and part of what is no now known as the Old Testament, the beginning of time and the source of the three main religions as we know it today. The cultural anthropology Anthropological aspect can be found in what the Western civilization acknowledges as the source of its origin. Greek mythology, philosophy, primarily and later on developing in Roman tradition, literature, politics, and judicial system. This mainstream continuation in striving for a better understanding of the why do we exist? Why are we here? 
can be found in man's exploration in the course of his own progress and life. The poet Homer wrote an epic journey, Odysseus, which is not only considered to be a heroic test of life, but can be seen as any human's quest in life to overcome trials and tribulations with the characteristic of a wishful happy ending. What can be derived from this story is that there is a constant battle between what in Greek mythology is believed the gods and their preferences decide and their own strides for power, reflecting the tendencies of their human counterparts. And in this way, all kinds of inexplicable phenomena were categorized, structured, and answered. It is only a matter of time before our why becomes a how, which becomes the basis of developments of ideologies and philosophies, because it is then a continuum of questions that deals with the subject of today, how to interpret the question derived from why, and what can be deemed as oppression, and what does liberation, and when does liberation take place? From ancient Rome, where the transition from the uh, polytheistic religions were gradually eased out by some decades of suppressing the Christian faith, finally recognized by Emperor Constantine. As we also hover between tolerance to one religion faith and another, we see that the prosecution, persecution also shifts and changes, which indicates that the why becomes dominated by the how. In retrospect, we can establish that the how deals with the question of how can we establish and subsequently maintain power. That is the original ground why and how manipulation of organized religion commenced their power struggle. Christianity based on the New Testament and the spreading of the Gospels as related by the Apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, serving as a dynamic testimony to Jesus of Nazareth's preaching. We see their statements in the forms of letters with their accounts on the related events. And when we move to the Middle Ages, 1050 to 1300, from the Crusades to Palestine to the Inquisition in Spain, all have one basic principle in common, how to maintain the Christian doctrine to safeguard structure and strategic power with another characteristic to be justified in establishing rule and acts of oppression in the name of God. Now, <clears throat> I know I'm bombarding you with a lot of information and it's very condensed historic overview on the development of Christianity in the Western world and its doctrine. But I choose these records as main events and examples in how one can perceive instances which relate to both religious as well as cultural aspects. And to do that, I have to retrace my steps. I will need to go back to the moment that our creator, God, as the regardings in the Old Testament go, preceded the instance before he created Eve. The accounts refer to the way the first being was created from the same material at the same time that Adam was created, Earth. This indicated that both were created equal, men and wife. And the legend alphabet of Sirach told us of a being in a female form that was meant to be the partner and spouse, but refused to be subservient to Adam, decided to leave and not return to the Garden of Eden. And she was named Lilith. It's quite obvious why these people who had editing rights in the story, in the narrative, decided that this was an undesirable role model and could not be mentioned in any holy scriptures. So up until the Middle Ages, Lilith was not mentioned. And after that, she was literally demonetized. 
even though the more acceptable version of Eve being created out of a rib or the side of Adam and making her subservient by means of his material, the fear of women seemed well established in the minds of men. Now, why could this be? And moreover, how should it be amended? As we know, the Adam and Eve version gave an opportunity to testify of the importance of role patterns because it was against God's strict orders that Eve decided that she would go against and was tempted by the fact that she would hold the answers to the big why, unwittingly stepping into the trap in becoming the bearer of original sin and dragging humanity and her naive husband with it. Up until today, this label has stuck unconsciously in the mind of the so-called righteous, apparently justifying so many breaches of human rights and abuse as we know it, because women deserve to be treated in this way. Yet the liberating explanation to the function and status of Eve did materialize, but not before the 17th century, where the following was stated. Eve was created to be Adam's equal in dignity. Many commentators over the centuries have highlighted the fact that Eve was created from Adam's side or rib, not his head, nor his feet. On the 18th century biblical exegete put it this way. Eve was not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. It has often been remarked that by studying the antiquities, there are foundations of our modern democracy and originated in Greece, then towards Rome and spreading throughout the rest of Europe. The narrative of, the, of Odyssey reflects the transcendent phases of human life. Within each step, some deity intervenes or needs to be replicated. It is an interesting proposition that gods and goddesses can actually be addressed to fulfill a human's wish or desire by offerings and promises to worship them eternally in exchange for specific favors. It is almost as though humans feel they are empowered to raise themselves to a certain stature that would entitle them to certain privileges. <clears throat> is that not how the Trojan War started? by a sheer, sheer indulgence of the gods during a wedding party where vanity of one gained the favor of a mortal who, quote, unquote, launched a thousand ships. In itself, this could be seen as a liberating aspect of how the early Greek and Roman religious citizens viewed their options. The same could be said for the long-suffering wife of Odysseus who had to cope with years of relenting social pressure to choose a new husband, now that her former one was presumed dead. Even the extent of social pressure for women to marry and remarry is still valid today. However, much of these myths are now being classified as fantasies, legends, myths. The idea that one could bargain or even deal a better outcome or destiny originated and became a major dispute in the Christian doctrine. Luther brought this sub objection to the bartering element up for scrutiny and caused the split in the Roman Catholic Church to amend this opportunistic conduct known as Reformation. And up until quite recently in Northern Ireland, disputes and civil religious violence have been enticed and supported by clergy. With the institutionalized religions, which progressed during the Middle Ages, we see a further tendency that it subscribes the how. The answer points towards politics, politics and, not, and do not include in content 
the spiritual meaning of faith, but serve worldly powers. I don't know whether you are seeing at this moment by uh, PowerPoint, but it is very important to see how the explanation of natural things and the need to ask the questions why and find the answers thereto now progresses definitely to the question how. How can a stability be achieved among the people, give them bread and games? How can territories be expanded in order to sustain the need for ample provisions? How can a strategy be developed to ensure political balance and maintain power of governance? And how can we ensure our plans and wishes are granted by means of offerings to our gods to go to confession, to pay a certain amount of fees and contribute and um, do all sorts of charitable work, which are seen by society. From finding answers to finding means to rule, how to establish geographical strongholds and power within regions and peoples, even if that would mean battle, blood and destruction. The justifications of the crusader, Crusades is just one example of how Christianity thought they could extinguish the pagan religions from Palestine and subsequently influenced expansion of missions of the Roman Catholic Church and ultimately enriched Rome, later the Vatican in 1929 with its proceeds. So implementations in the dark ages and middle ages and how was to show how human beings handled their idea of and being creative with uh, tools of oppression, um, how to do, dominate territories, how to find strategies, how to safeguard proceeds from expeditions like the Crusades and how to implement divide to rule mechanism in a common society, how to set up courts and executions to control and, and administer inquis inquisition procedures. It justifies, it started from in the how procedures and processes, it started justifying certain actions of people, of the human beings to dominate. So tools to rule by fear from the point of view of Rome, of course, no doubt they will, they will not have viewed these actions as being oppressive, but the total lack of respect for other people's culture and religious tradition, which simply did not matter as seen as a threat and crime to the Roman Catholic doctrine. They clearly showed the double edged sword by which they acted all opposed had to be annihilated by fire and brimstone. And this thought pattern was perpetuated in the form of witch hunts, curbing the findings in science and philosophers like Descartes, Copernicus, and Galileo by the excruciating dehumanizing methods of the Inquisition. And this is the most cruelest form shows us the true face of oppression. It has proven that this methodology of cleansing the nation and its allies of a common enemy is still used in modern civilized world. So if you don't like what certain opponents are planning or doing, simply declare them a perpetrator of dubious acts. The same applied in those times to Jeanne d'Arc who found a cruel end on the burning stake but was later cleared from all accusations of heresy in 1456. In 1803, she was recognized as a national symbol of France and declared a saint in 1920, which shows that one has to be prepared to give one's life to save and serve one's country. In other words, there's always hope, even if it's about 500 years late. So all these examples, and I know it's a lot to take in, 
but the why, progressing to the how, and then posing another question. A question that is relative today, relevant for all of us. The burning question of what? Question what of what? can we do? What can we do to change these to attitudes? Change these attitudes that stem from the basic concept stem from the basic concept of religious training. What does it take to alter attitudes and mentalities toward people from different color skins, religions? cultures and beliefs and bring equality? What should we seek in and restore of the ancient origins that form the foundation of our po political systems? The basic there was only men, women with an outstanding record of contributions to society, to society can and should be considered for government posts and will be chosen to public office. What should we safeguard and protect to avoid that the integrity of our faith is not polluted by political agendas? What do we need to focus on and be alert on the way our society tends to hide behind its name? and dare to assume, to know that we can even imagine what he wants us to do. What do we express when we say our Lord's Prayer? Our Father. The concept is that we all belong to one Father. Then what is that so much of the religious conflicts is focused on that very fact? And what should we look for if we say, and he created us in his image? What should we look for in our fellow human being when we try to envisage his image? Because in the development of today, I cannot for the life of me discover anything remotely gov godly in the way we treat each other. Look after the planet or the way we, behind, we hide behind his name in order to destroy. Whatever the questions I have only brought to you in this very, very short time may be, it should bring us back to the core of our relationship with our creator. We have to return to our hearts and start looking for the true nature of our beliefs and not look what, towards what organized institutions dictate us to think, believe, or act upon. We need to look sternly and honestly to our own motivations for the true reasons that we do certain things and how we want to achieve whatever we wish for. <clears throat> These times, which test us all and affect us all, ask a different approach to what we feel is the content of our faith. And I feel we need to take a careful look towards our inner life. So to discover our true destiny, that will take another kind of journey, another kind of quest, one that I hope will take us closer to the purpose of our lives. But even though it will be hard and it will take time and practice, I really do believe that it's the only way in we can start a dialogue with God and hopefully in the stillness of his presence, finding the right questions to ask, we can hear his voice. Religion is an integral part of our society. And the human race will not be able to exist without it because it is the most essential way in which we can find ourselves and be one in the eyes of God. It enables us to rise above the self-interest and is still in the very core of our being through the practice of compassion, through the intensive self-reflection and examination of our motivations, in taking responsibility for our actions, plus the unreserved sharing of our talents 
to the benefit of our perspective communities and others. We will experience the liberation we all long for and allow us to live in peace. With that, and as I conclude my contribution, thank you very much for your attention. And I wish you a very peaceful, healthy, and happy festive seasons. Blessings to you all. Okay.